Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the general principles of law and in this lecture we shall have a look at the rule of law. Rule of law asks these basic questions. Should some people have concessions based on their birth, race, caste etc. That is, do you treat everybody equally under law or do you treat people unequally? Should certain people have an advantaged position or a disadvantaged position because of their race, caste or other characteristics? That is the first question that the rule of law asks. The second is, should you have one law for all or you should have different laws for different people? And who will guarantee the rights and liberties of the citizens? So basically, when we say that the legislature has the power to create laws, is this an unbridled power? That is, does the legislature have all the power, all that is it has a supreme power, it can do whatever it likes. Is that the situation or we should have a situation where the power of the legislature is subject to certain restrictions? The rule of law states that the power of legislature to make laws is not an absolute power. It is subject to certain restrictions and only if laws follow those restrictions, then we will say that the country or the state is having a rule of law. Otherwise, we will not call it a rule of law. So, these three things. Do you differentiate between people? Do you have different laws for different peoples? Or who should guarantee the rights and liberties of the citizens. Now, why do we need to think about the rule of law? It is because for a large period of time, different legislature have created laws that have been morally abhorrent. So, they, there have been laws that if they were enacted today, then people would probably revolt. They would say that no, this is not a correct law. We have seen before that we have a thesis that says that an unjust law is not a law at all. But then how do you define whether or how do you come to know whether a law is unjust or not? So, let us look at a few of these laws. Section 5.1 of the Population Registration Act 1950 of South Africa, we have seen this before, it said that people have to be differentiated by the director, people have to be classified by the director as either a white person, a colored person or a native person. So, this was a law that differentiated between people based on their skin color, white, colored or native. And for every person who was either a colored or a native, then that person would be further subdivided on the basis of ethnic or other group to which that person belonged. Now, the question is, should government be differentiating people based on their skin color? What has government got to do with that? Today, we might think that such an exercise is not only futile, but it is abhorrent. That is, we as a society should not be permitting this thing to differentiate between people based on their skin colors. The law should be the same for all. But this was a law that was actually enacted by a legislature. Then these differences were also made permanent by different laws. Article 1 of the law for the protection of German blood and German honor enacted by the Nazi party said that marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are forbidden. That is, if you are a Jew, you are not allowed to marry a person who is of a German descent. So, all your offsprings will for perpetuity be classified as Jews. There cannot be any intermixing between both of these groups of people. 
Now the question is, marriage takes place when two people are in love. What has government got to do with saying that you can marry such person or you cannot marry such person? Is this the government's prerogative? Should government be making such laws at all? Today we won't allow these laws. Today we'll find it socially, morally abhorrent. But this again was a law that was passed by the legislature to create permanency. It said marriages nevertheless concluded are invalid even if concluded abroad to circumvent this law. So you are, first of all, you are divided based on your religion and then this division is made permanent. We had a similar law from South Africa as well, Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act 1949. A marriage between a European and a non-European may not be solemnized. What has got about what has government got to do with this? And if somebody marries, if a European and a non-European people marry, then the, such a marriage shall be void and of no effect. That is, the legal protections that are available through marriage, such as property rights or such as tax benefits, they will not be extended to these people. The children that are born out of these, these marriages will not be considered to be legitimate children. Now, what has got, government got to do with who marries whom? But such laws were created to ensure that the differences remain as such for perpetuity. That is, the white race should not mix with the other races. There should be no dilution of the whiteness, so to speak. And why were these laws created? They were created to bring in discrimination. Now, discrimination is a process where you put a person to certain hardship based on certain characteristics of that person and because of no wrong that the person has done. So, basically, if a person has uh, committed an offense and if you put that person in jail, then the society would be okay with it. That, okay, this person committed an offense and so this person is being penalized in the interest of the society. But in these cases, what is happening is that people are being penalized because of their religion or because of their skin color. Not in the interest of the society, but in the interest of the political parties that made these laws. So, laws such as these, which are morally abhorrent, which are not justified, which are unjustified, will break the condition of the rule of law. Now, this is a law from the United States. Any alien being a free white person, if he or she remains inside United States, can become a citizen. But a person who is not a white person cannot become a citizen. Now, these laws with the change of time, all of these laws were repealed. But the question here is, if these laws were made at some point of time, then it is still possible that some government may enact such a law. And so, how do we protect the citizens? How do we protect the rights of the citizens against such laws is what the rule of law talks about. Another example is Section 21 of the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act. So, this act from South Africa, it said that any public premise or public vehicle will have to be set apart or reserved for the exclusive use of persons belonging to a particular race or class. That is, you are going to have a separate bus for white person and a separate bus for a black or a colored person. You are going to have separate ticket counters. You are going to have separate drinking fountains. You are going to have separate beaches. You are going to have separate schools, separate hospitals. And the problem with such acts is that once the society is okay with uh, with these sorts of uh, actions that separate that create separate facilities for different groups of people. Then later on, if the government starts to underfund the facilities for colored or native citizens, then there is no recourse left. And so these are violations of the rule of law. Another example 
is from the US. This is section 301 of the code of Alabama. This again said shall have separate waiting rooms or space and separate ticket windows for the white and colored races. So all passenger stations shall have, they must have. If they do not have, then those people who are in charge of these passenger stations can be prosecuted. So these are all examples of discrimination. This is another example, again from the US the code of the city of Montgomery. Every person operating a bus line in the city shall provide equal but separate accommodations. So this is how discrimination starts. The government says you will, you must provide equal but separate accommodations. You cannot accommodate white peoples with the Negroes, that is the black people. You cannot accommodate both of them together. You have to provide equal but separate accommodations and then with the passage of time this equality clause will get diluted because the government would say that for such and such reasons we are not able to provide sufficient funds and so we are going to only provide funds for these accommodations that are there for the white people and not for the negroes so this is how discrimination is started and is perpetuated this is another example from South Africa. No disqualified person shall occupy and no person shall allow any disqualified person to occupy any land or premises in any group area to which the proclamation relates. So what this law did was to divide South Africa into places for white people, places for Negroes, places for native people. And people of one class are completely prohibited from residing in an area that is earmarked for people of a separate class just based on their skin color. Now this is the, uh, the law that defined the apartheid. So such discriminatory laws are violative of the rule of law. So with these examples let us now understand what is the rule of law. Rule of law is the restriction of the arbitrary exercise of power by subordinating it to well-defined and established laws. That is, rule of law is a restriction, it is a check on the power. What power? An arbitrary exercise of power. That is, just because you are a, a legislature, you cannot say that we will make whatever we feel like. There have to be certain checks and balances, there have to be certain restrictions. So, rule of law creates these restrictions on the arbitrary exercise of power and how does it create these restrictions by subordinating the power to well defined and established laws. So there are laws that will govern what law can be created or not created, that is the rule of law. So the law has to be the supreme. These are the characteristics of the rule of law as propounded by Dicey. The first one is supremacy of law. Nobody is above the law, even the lawmakers. That is, even the lawmakers are bound by the law. They cannot say that because we are making laws, so we are above everybody else. Now, this stands in the face of what we discussed before. In legal positivism, we said that law is the command of the sovereign and if the sovereign commands anything, whether it is right or wrong, you have to follow it. But the rule of law says that the sovereign is not above the law. The sovereign is also bound by the law. Now the sovereign today is the government which is comprised of the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. And the rule of law is saying that the legislature that is making the laws, it is also subject to the laws that have been created to ensure that the power to make laws is not exploited. It is not misused. So the first point is supremacy of law. Law is supreme. The second is equality before law, impartiality before law. The law should consider everybody to be equal. It should not be a situation that because a person is European or because a person belongs to a certain religion or because a person belongs to a certain caste, so he or she is given either an undue advantage or an undue disadvantage. 
No. The rule of law says that everybody should be treated equally. So that is equality before the law. This is to ensure that the law is impartial for all. It does not have a partial characteristic. It does not favor or disfavor anybody. So any law must ensure that there is equality before law. And third is the predominance of the legal spirit. Courts of law must act as the guarantors and protectors of the liberty of citizens. Merely writing the liberties in a constitution is not enough. Courts should be impartial and free from external influences. So not only is the rule of law binding the lawmakers, but it is also binding the courts of law. So it is saying that it is a duty of the courts to act as guarantors and protectors of the liberty of the citizens. Now, because the, the United Kingdom does not have a written constitution, so Dicey went as far as to state that even the fundamental rights should come from the people and from the courts, not merely from the constitution. So basically, the courts have to act in such a manner that they guarantee the liberties of citizens, that is the rights of the citizens, and they protect the liberty of the citizens. That is their main requirement. And they have to be impartial in their conduct and free from external influences. So these are the three characteristics of the rule of law, supremacy of law, equality before law, and predominance of the legal spirit everywhere. Now, it is important to note here that rule of law is not the same as rule by law. Rule by law means that you are just following the laws that are created. Rule of law says that the law itself is bound by certain other laws or rules. Now, the law making powers of the sovereign have to be kept in check so that arbitrary and whimsical laws do not get created. This is what the rule of law is saying. That you have to keep a check on the law making powers of the sovereign. Why do you want to keep it in check so that arbitrary laws and whimsical laws just made out of whims and fancies of the lawmakers, they do not get created. The doctrine of separation of powers is an integral part of the rule of law so that the organs of government act as checks and balances on each other. So the separation of powers, that is, there is not a single body that has all the three powers to make laws, to execute laws and to adjudicate laws. There should not be a body that has all these three powers. It should be divided between the three organs of the government, that is the legislature, executive and judiciary. The legislature makes the laws, the executive implements the laws and the judiciary adjudicates the disputes that arise during the implementation of the laws. So all these three organs are separate and they have to be kept separate so that they act as checks and balances on each other. So if one organ does something wrong, then the second organ can stop that. So basically, if the legislature is doing something wrong against the rule of law, then the executive can say that we are not going to follow this. The judiciary can adjudicate that such and such thing was wrong. So it's not a law at all. If the executive is trying to misuse its powers, then the legislature can make a new law to hold the executive in its place. And the judiciary can rule that such and such executive actions are incorrect. If the judiciary is misusing the powers, then the legislature can make a law to bind the judiciary in their own sphere or the executive can make use of its powers to ensure that this misuse of powers is not done. So these three organs of the government, they act as checks and balances. So the separation of powers is an integral part of the rule of law. Now there are seven principal meanings of the rule of law as propounded by Davis. The first one is law and order. So we are doing this rule of law to ensure that law and order situation is maintained. 
you need to have fixed rules if rules are fixed if there is no discretion in the application of rules then you have a situation of rule of law the processes have to be fair everything has to be done through the due process of law following the rules and regulations of the law natural law is an integral part of the rule of law natural law is something that we'll look at in more detail in the next lecture but it is the observance of the principles of natural justice what are the principles of natural justice the first one says that you cannot be a judge in your own case so basically if you have a bias towards something or against something then you should not be educate adjudicating on that particular matter so that is the first rule of natural justice the second rule is that nobody should be condemned unheard that is you have to hear both the parties out and only by looking at what evidences they have presented by looking at what they have said what they have put up before the court of law only on the basis of that should any decisions or any uh, justice be done so these are the two principles of natural justice following them is natural law and it is an integral part of the rule of law preference for judges and ordinary courts of law to executive authorities and administrative tribunals so it says that if you have executive authorities then because they might misuse their powers so you need to have a preference for judges so judges should be able to say whether the executive action was right or wrong and similarly ordinary courts are to be preferred over administrative tribunals because in an open court because everybody is looking at what the judges are doing so it is better as compared to administrative tribunals and there must be a judicial review of administrative actions so that the administration or the executive does not misuse its powers so these are the seven principal meanings of the rule of law so this is how we can understand what this concept of rule of law is all about there are certain principles that all the governments have to follow now these principles were also expounded in the 1959 declaration of delhi of the international commission of jurists so they said that the rule of law is a dynamic concept it is not a static concept so it changes with time and why does it change for the expansion and fulfillment of which jurists are primarily responsible so basically if you have the rule of law then the rights and liberties of the people they get expanded over time people get more and more rights and liberties and they are able to fulfill them so these rights and liberties are protected and they are ensured and the who will do the, this expansion and fulfillment of rights and uh, liberties it will be the jurists the judges they are primarily responsible for this and which should be employed not only to safeguard and advance the civil and political rights of the individual in a free society but also to establish social economic educational and cultural conditions under which his legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized so why do you want to do all this you first of all you want to do it to safeguard and advance the civil and political rights of the individual in a free society so you need to ensure that the rights that people have they are maintained and if possible they should be advanced that is they should be extended because pe people who are living in a free society they require these civil and political rights be without these a free society cannot exist but this rule of law is a concept not only to safeguard and advance but it is also to establish social economic educational and cultural conditions under which his legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized meaning that when we say legitimate aspirations what do people aspire legally and do they have dignity dignity of life so the legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized you have to create conditions 
what kind of conditions economic conditions that is a role of the jurist is also to ensure that there is no major poverty in the society that there is no large difference between the ultra rich and the ultra poor so that people are able to realize their legitimate aspirations even if they are poor so for this it is necessary to create economic conditions where you do not have large differences and where you do not have a large absolute poverty educational conditions that is people should have adequate education that allows them to realize their legitimate aspirations and dignity so things like free education is something that is an integral part of the rule of law cultural conditions and social conditions so the socio cultural milieu also has to be so looked into that it permits people to realize their legitimate aspirations and their dignity so this is what the delhi declaration says that rule of law is a dynamic concept for the expansion and fulfillment of which jurists are primarily responsible which should be employed not only to safeguard and advance the civil and political rights of the individual in a free society but also to establish social economic educational and cultural conditions under which his legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized now this declaration of delhi by the international commission of jurists is also referred to by the honorable supreme court of india so it is not that this is just a commission that came up said something and the things are not taken care of our honorable supreme court of india also refers to this declaration again and again in its judgments so the next question is it's okay to make the declarations but do we have a rule of law in india or not so let us look at the provisions in our constitution the preamble says and to secure to all its citizens justice social economic and political so the aim or the objective of the constitution of india is to secure to all its citizens meaning without discrimination we want to secure to all citizens justice including social justice economic justice and political justice so basically this is what we have just seen before you have to create social economic and political conditions so that justice is realized people are able to fulfill their legal aspirations and dignity and the constitution of india is securing this justice social economic and political to all its citizens without any discrimination then it further continues equality of status and of opportunity so we saw that equality is a primary concept of the rule of law and the preamble is saying that in this constitution we are going to have equality of status and of opportunity when we say of opportunity it means that the legal aspirations are going to be fulfilled by all the citizens irrespective of their status so they are not going to be discriminated against equality of status <coughs> means that everybody is going to have a dignified life without any discrimination article 14 the fundamental right it says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of laws within the territory of india article 15 says the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them now here what you are observing here is that at the same time when south africa was coming up with the apartheid laws that were discriminating people on the basis of their skin color our constitution was giving these rights to people and it was saying that there will be equality and there will not be any discrimination article 21 says no person shall be convicted of any offense except for violation of a law in force at the time of the commission of the act now we saw before that the acts should have prospective applications they should not be retrospective in the case of a rule of law so you cannot hold a person guilty 
of a law that was not made at the time when the offence was committed. People should know what are the offences so that they can decide for themselves. And so Article 21 is saying that no person shall be convicted of any offence except for violation of a law that was in force at the time of commission of the act. You will not have retrospective laws and convict people on the basis of them. Charged as an offence nor be subjected to a penalty greater than that which might have been inflicted under the law in force at the time of the commission of the offence. So with a retrospective application you cannot increase the penalty. You can only give the penalty that was prescribed at the time of commission of the offence. Article 21 says no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. Here again it says no person. So there is no discrimination in Article 21. That though Article 21 is saying except according to the procedure established by law, the Supreme Court then extended Article 21. So as we saw before that the courts have a major role in the expansion of these rights, freedoms and liberties. So this is what the Honorable Supreme Court is doing. In this case, Menka Gandhi versus Union of India 1978, the Supreme Court said the procedure established by law does not mean procedure, however fantastic and oppressive or arbitrary, which in truth and reality is no procedure at all. So when the constitution is saying except according to procedure established by law, the Supreme Court is binding the legislature by saying that you cannot establish any procedure. The procedure has to be a correct procedure. It should not be fantastic or oppressive or arbitrary. Because if you do that, then we will say that there is no procedure at all. So here again, the Supreme Court is binding the legislature and expanding the rights of the citizens. Article 22.2 says, every person who is arrested and detained in custody shall be produced before the nearest magistrate within a period of 24 hours of such arrest. Now, arrest and detention are executive powers. And here the constitution of India is saying that this executive power is subject to what the magistrate is saying. So you have a judicial review of the administrative actions. The judiciary is above the executive in this case. So the executive is also being bound. It does not have an arbitrary power, but is being bound by the judiciary. Every person who is arrested and detained in custody shall be produced. When it says shall be produced, it means must be produced. You do not have any option here. Every person has to be produced before the nearest magistrate within a period of 24 hours of such arrest. You cannot keep him more than 24 hours without producing him or her before the nearest magistrate. Article 32.1 says the right to move the Supreme Court by appropriate proceedings for the enforcement of the rights conferred by this part is guaranteed. So what is Article 32.1 saying? That every citizen has the right to move the Supreme Court for uh, by appropriate proceedings for the enforcement of the rights conferred by this part, which is the fundamental rights. So the fundamental rights are being guaranteed and they are being guaranteed by the Supreme Court of India. So this is what we saw in the case of rule of law, that the courts must act as the guarantors of the rights and our constitution is also saying the same thing. So basically we have a rule of law in India. Article 32.2 says, the Supreme Court shall have power to issue directions or orders of writs, including writs in the nature of habeas corpus. So the court can ask the executive to bring any person in front of the court. Habeas corpus means we must have the body. Bring this person in front of us. Mandamus, meaning that the Supreme Court can make any order to the executive. Prohibition. The Supreme Court can tell the executive that you are not going to do this. You are prohibited from doing this. 
quo warranto, meaning that the Supreme Court can ask the executor, what was your authority to do this thing? And certiorari, meaning that the Supreme Court can take cases from other places before it sits. So, the Supreme Court has power to issue directions or orders or writs, including all of these five writs, whichever may be appropriate for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this part. That is the fundamental rights, rights conferred by this part is the fundamental right. For the enforcement of the fundamental rights, the Supreme Court is given these wide powers to issue any directions, orders or writs. Article 141 says, the law declared by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts within the territory of India. Article 142.1 says, the Supreme Court in the exercise of its jurisdiction may pass such decree or make such order as is necessary for doing complete justice in any cause or matter pending before it. So, the Supreme Court can make any order, it can pass any decree if it finds that it is necessary to do complete justice. So, the, the Supreme Court is not just a guarantor of the rights, but is also given all these wide powers. Not just the Supreme Court, but also the High Court. Article 226.1 says, notwithstanding anything in Article 32, every High Court shall have power throughout the territories in relation to which it exercises jurisdiction to issue to any person or authority, including in appropriate cases, any government. So, here the high courts are above the government. They can order, uh, they can issue orders to any government within those territories. Directions, orders or writs, including writs in the nature of habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, quo warranto and certiorari or any of them for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by part 3, that is the fundamental rights and for any other purpose. So, in this case, the, uh, the powers of the high court are also at times above the, the supreme court because the high court can issue these writs, it can issue directions, orders or writs not just for enforcement of fundamental rights, but also for any other purpose. In the case of Supreme Court, they have the power to issue directions, orders and writs only for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this part, only for cases of fundamental rights. But in the case of high courts, they have also the right to issue these for any other purpose. So, in all of these, what we are observing is that the judiciary has been put above the executive and the legislature. And so, there is a judicial review of things. The courts can say that, okay, such and such thing is wrong, we are outlawing it, you are, uh, you are, uh, it is mandatory for you to do this or not to do this and they can take up any case before them. So, all said and done, basically it looks like we have a rule of law in India, but then there are also these exceptions. Article 15.3 of the constitution says, nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision for women and children. Now, earlier we were seeing that there is the right to equality, but now we are seeing that the state is making special provisions for women and children. So, is this, is this not discrimination? Article 15.4 says, nothing in this article or in clause 2 of article 29 shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. Now, so far we have looked at cases of equality. The constitution is saying everybody is equal, there will be no discrimination. But the same constitution is saying that no, there will be discrimination for these classes of people. So, are we a rule of law or not? Article 15.5 says, nothing in this article or in sub clause G of clause 1 of article 19 shall prevent the state from making any special provision by law for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled castes or the scheduled tribes in so far as such provisions relate to their admission 
to educational institutions including private educational institutions whether aided or unaided by the state other than the minority educational institutions referred to in clause 1 of article 30. Now article 15.5 is again giving power to the government to make special provision to make a law for the advancement of socially and educationally backward classes of citizens for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So, is this not a preferential treatment given to people? So, what is what about the uh, clause of equality? Article 16.4 says, nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any provision for the reservation of appointments or posts in favor of any backward class of citizens, which in the opinion of the state is not adequately represented in the services under the state. So, we were talking about equality of opportunity, but now we are talking about reservation in appointments. Article 22.3 says, nothing in clauses 1 and 2 shall apply to any person who for the time being is an enemy alien or to any person who is arrested or detained under any law providing for preventive detention. Now, we were seeing before that no person will be arrested, but for committing a crime that was a crime at the time when the offense was created, was committed. But here we are talking about preventive detention and ours is one of the very few constitutions in the world that talks about preventive detention. So, in this case, even if a person has not committed an offense, it is uh, possible to detain this person, to arrest this person and to detain this person. So, what about the rule of law in this case? Is this not violative? Article 33 says, Parliament may by law determine to what extent any of the rights conferred by this part shall in their application to members of the armed forces, members of forces charged with the maintenance of public order, persons employed in any bureau or other organization established by the state for purposes of intelligence or counterintelligence or persons employed in or in connection with the telecommunication systems set up for the purposes of any force, bureau or organization referred to in clauses A to C be restricted or even abrogated that is revoked so as to ensure the proper discharge of their duties and the maintenance of discipline among them. So, for certain categories of people, the rights are also getting curtailed. So, there is positive discrimination and there is also a negative discrimination. Which again brings us to this question, do we have a rule of law in India or not? Article 34 says, notwithstanding anything in the foregoing provisions of this part, Parliament may by law indemnify any person. Indemnify means that if the person has committed any offence, the parliament can say that no, we are not going to consider this to be an offence. In respect, uh, in service of the union or of a state or any other person, in respect of any act done by him in connection with the maintenance or restriction of order or restoration of order in any area within the territory of India where martial law was in force or validate any sentence passed, punishment inflicted, forfeiture ordered or, uh, or other act done under martial law in such an area. So, what this article is saying is that if you have a martial law in any area, then the parliament may by law overrule the decisions of the judiciary. So, what about judicial supremacy here? Article 359.1 says, where a proclamation of emergency is in operation, the president may by order declare that the right to move any court for the enforcement of such of the rights conferred by part 3, except articles 20 and 21, as may be mentioned in the order and all proceedings pending in any court for the enforcement of the rights so mentioned shall remain suspended for the period during which the proclamation is in force or for such shorter period as may be specified in the order. Now, when we say president, the president can during emergencies uh, put down the fundamental rights. He can suspend the execution of the fundamental rights and the president acts on the advice of the government. So, basically what this article is saying 
is that the government has the power to issue a declaration of emergency and after issuing this declaration of emergency the government can uh, suspend the fundamental rights so what about judicial supremacy now article 361 2 says no criminal proceedings whatsoever shall be instituted or continued against the president or the governor of a state in any court during his term or of office this again looks to be violative of the um, right to equality or equal protection of law this article is basically saying that you cannot have any criminal proceedings against the president or the governor so if the president and the governor are given these powers are they above the law similarly article 361 says no process for the arrest or imprisonment of the president or the governor of a state shall issue from any court during his term of office so the same constitution that was talking about the rule of law that was providing all of these guarantees is also saying that there will be positive discrimination there will be negative discrimination you cannot arrest a president or a governor you cannot have a criminal proceedings against the president or the governor during their terms of office and so on then apart from these constitutional provisions we also have the practical issues of red tape and corruption so in this setting do we have a rule of law in india or not now to answer that question we can look at the rule of law and affirmative action the question here is that a just law should treat equals equally this is what the rule of law says everybody should be treated equally and everybody should have the equal protection of laws now in this case if it is a just law then it should treat everybody that is equal equally but then does it also mean that a just law should treat unequals unequally that is if a person is say educationally backward or socially backward or does not have sufficient money sufficient resources then should this person be given certain advantage and if these advantages are given will we call this law to be under the category of rule of law or not and if we agree that the just law should treat unequals unequally then to what extent should it treat them basic thing is how do we create a level playing field so that everybody is able to reach to their legitimate aspirations and their dignity so that was the fundamental thing in the rule of law now if everybody is to reach their uh, legitimate aspirations and everybody is to have their dignity then it it also becomes uh, necessary that people who are disadvantaged be given certain advantage so that there is a level playing field so the features of laws that are consistent with the rule of law are these as far as possible they should have a prospective nature not retrospective so that is guaranteed by our constitution there should be a relative stability and in our country there is a very high stability of laws we even have the indian penal code from 1860 applicable today so that is corresponding with the rule of law it should advance the interest of everyone it should advance the common good and not only of the dominant groups to create the level playing field now in our constitution we are saying that it is advancing the interest of of everybody and not just the dominant groups and to in to advance the interest of everybody the disadvantaged classes are given certain advantages to create a level playing field so if we are advancing the interest of everybody and not just the dominant groups then it becomes consistent with the rule of law it should not be substantially unjust it should not target a group or violate the fundamental rights of a person or a group and as we have seen the constitution is not unjust towards any people it is not targeting a group it is only doing a positive discrimination and not a negative discrimination it is not saying that persons of such and such color or persons of such and such caste are going to be discriminated against they are going to suffer such and such penalties it's not saying that so we can say that our laws are in 
consonance with the rule of law. It should be applied by an independent judiciary and in India we have an independent judiciary. Things should be subject to judicial review by courts and we have seen that nearly everything is subject to the judicial review by the courts. So, we can say that by and large we have a rule of law in India, there can be certain caveats, we can do better, but we cannot say that there is no rule of law in India. There is, but we can always do better and this is uh, what is also there when we say that the rule of law is a dynamic concept. So, with the passage of time, we can improve upon what we are doing, but we do have a rule of law in India. Now, the Honorable Supreme Court in uh, this case, Keshwananda Bharti versus the state of Kerala and others said that our constitution postulates rule of law in the sense of supremacy of the constitution and the laws as opposed to arbitrariness. So, basically what the Honorable Supreme Court is saying is that rule of law is a part of the constitution of India. There has to be supremacy of the constitution and the laws that is the laws and the constitution. Constitution is basically the basic law of the land. So, the laws are supreme as opposed to arbitrariness. Then in the case of Indira Nehru Gandhi versus Sri Na Raj Narayan in 1975, the Honorable Supreme Court also said that imperfection of language hinder a precise definition of the rule of law as of the definition of law itself. So, it is difficult to define law, it is difficult to define the rule of law, especially because things have been changing. The constitutional law of 1975 has undergone many changes since A. V. Dicey, the great expounder of the rule of law, delivered his lectures as Vinarian Professor of English Law at Oxford. Why 1975? Because this is a case from 1975. So, basically the Supreme Court is saying that the constitutional law has undergone many changes since the time of Dicey, the person who propounded the rule of law. It can be said with reasonable certainty that the rule of law means that the exercise of powers of government shall be conditioned by law and that subject to the exceptions to the doctrine of equality, no one shall be exposed to the arbitrary will of the government. So, basically the powers of the government are restricted and subject to certain exceptions to the doctrine of equality, nobody shall be exposed to the arbitrary will of the government. So, nobody can be negatively discriminated against except for certain exceptions that the constitution has provided. Dicey gave three meanings to the rule of law, absence of arbitrary power, equality before the law or the equal subjugation of all classes to the ordinary law of the land administered by ordinary law courts and that the constitution is not the source, but the consequence of the rights of individuals as defined and enforced by the courts. So, this is what Dicey had said, absence of arbitrary power that is everybody or even the sovereign is subject to the law, equality before the law and the third is the judicial spirit that is the courts should uh, define and enforce the rights of the individuals, not just the constitution. But the Supreme Court is saying that the third meaning, that is the uh, consequences of the rights of individuals is not given by the constitution, but is defined and enforced by the courts. But the third meaning is hardly opposite, that is hardly appropriate or suitable in the context of our written constitution. For in India, the constitution is the source of all rights and obligations. We may not therefore rely wholly on Dicey's exposition of the rule of law. So, we have a different flavor of the rule of law. The Honorable Supreme Court in Bachan Singh, Sher Singh and another versus the state of Punjab said that if we look at the various constitutional provisions including the chapters on fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy, it is clear that the rule of law permeates the entire fabric of the constitution and indeed forms one of its basic features. So, the Supreme Court is saying that the rule of law is spread throughout the, the fabric of the constitution. So, everything is following the rule of law and it indeed forms one of the basic features. So, basic features means that this feature cannot be removed 
by an amendment of the constitution. This is a fundamental feature of the constitution and if you change this, it will not be called an amendment, but it will be called a complete overthrow of the constitution itself. So, you cannot change the basic principle and the Supreme Court here is ruling that the rule of law is a basic feature of the constitution. The rule of law excludes arbitrariness, its postulate is intelligence without passion and reason free from desire. Where, wherever we find arbitrariness or unreasonableness, there is denial of the rule of law. That is why Aristotle preferred a government of law rather than of men. Law in the context of the rule of law does not mean any law enacted by the legislative authority, howsoever arbitrary or despotic it may be. So, just if the legislative authority has created a law, it does not mean that there is rule of law. Otherwise, even under a dictatorship, it would be possible to say that there is rule of law because every law made by the dictator, howsoever arbitrary and unreasonable, has to be obeyed and every action has to be taken in conformity with such law. What is a necessary element of the rule of law is that the law must not be arbitrary. So, this is important. The law must not be arbitrary or irrational. It has to be a rational law and it must satisfy the test of reason and the democratic form of polity seeks to ensure this element by making the framers of the law accountable to the people. The rule of law has really three basic and fundamental assumptions. One is that lawmaking must be essentially in the hands of a democratically elected legislature. So, basically democracy is, a, is an essential part of the rule of law. The other is that even in the hands of a democratically elected legislature, there should not be unfettered legislative power. So, even if the legislature is democratically elected, there should be certain restrictions. For as Jefferson said, let no man be trusted with power, but tie him down from making mischief by the chains of the constitution. And lastly, there must be an independent judiciary to protect the citizen against the excesses of the executive and legislative power. So, these are the three basic and fundamental assumptions of the rule of law as applicable to India. Now, it is an essential element of the rule of law that the sentence imposed must be proportionate to the offence, otherwise it will be called arbitrary. If a law provides for imposition of a sentence which is disproportionate to the offence, it would be arbitrary and irrational for it would not pass the test of reason and would be contrary to the rule of law and void under article 14, 19 and 21. The principle of proportionality is implicit in these three articles of the constitution. So, what the Supreme Court is saying here is that the Supreme Court is expanding the meaning of the rule of law, which is concurrent with the meaning of the rule of law. When we say that rule of law is a dynamic concept and it can be extended by the judiciary, this is what our Honorable Supreme Court is doing. So, we can be, uh, be satisfied in saying that yes, we do have a rule of law in India and the Supreme Court of India is playing a huge role in it by expanding the sets of rights, by giving newer definitions that are in consonance with the current conditions. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.